I'm Mary Frances Pasternak. I'm the Vice President for Economic Development and Entrepreneurship. Novelist Victor Hugo said, there is only one thing, there is only one thing stronger than all the armies in the world, and that is an idea whose time has come. And the idea, ladies and gentlemen, and our distinguished ESU students, for the Distinguished Entrepreneur Speaker Series was introduced by our president, Dr. Marsha Welsh. Since her arrival on campus in 2012, she has strategically developed the university as a recognized leader in the economic growth of our community. She has inspired a campus-wide culture that focuses on student success to ensure that you, our ESU students, get a great education that's accessible and affordable. Round of applause. <laughs> and most importantly, she has created an innovative educational environment at East, East Strasburg University that places students first and encourages you to be innovative, entrepreneurial, and fearless in pursuing your dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marsha Welsh, President of East Strasburg University. Always the Mary Francis, so thank you. She's our share, only one name, Mary Francis. So good evening and thank you all for being here this evening. I know some of you are here because of class assignments, some are here because you really are curious about exactly what's going on, but regardless, we really appreciate you being here and hope that you learn a lot from uh, the second presentation in this year's Distinguished Entrepreneur Speaker Series. This series was designed to provide a forum for entrepreneurs to share not only their successes, but their challenges, life experiences, and educational opportunities that guided them to where they are today. This series also joins other ESU initiatives that engage our campus and community in risk-taking and entrepreneurial thinking. Our university strategic plan was Students First Innovate ESU, and that was a three-year plan, and we were supposed to roll it, but we kind of got busy and got so involved in implementing the first plan that now we are just redoing the plan for another three years, and the new title is still in draft form, but almost complete, we just are, uh, have to complete our listening sessions with the campus, but the new title will be Students First, Empowering Innovation Through Collaboration, and it will continue to guide our efforts to create a culture of innovation at ESU. This past year, through our strategic planning efforts, we created SITE, which stands for Scholarship, Innovation, Teaching, and Entrepreneurship, and represents three unique learning spaces that have been repurposed to inspire entrepreneurial thinking. Our Business Accelerator program has worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs for nearly two decades, providing resources for early stage and established companies alike. And the University's Northeast Wildlife DNA Lab, currently the largest tick testing research facility in Pennsylvania, recently collaborated with the United Industries Corporation to rebrand Limeade Tick Testing Kit, the Limeade Tick Testing Kit, uh, under the world recognized cutter name. So now when you go to the store to buy a tick test, it is under the cutter name and your tick will come to ESU to be tested for Lyme. So it has been a, quite, a, quite a journey and pretty amazing for ESU. These are just a few of the examples of the efforts underway at ESU that are preparing our students for 21st century careers and building a vibrant entrepreneurial culture across <coughs> campus and in our community. The Distinguished Entrepreneur Speaker Series was launched in April of 2017 with ESU alumnus Dan Dizio, CEO and founder of the Philly Pretzel Factory, the world's largest Philly-style pretzel bakery. This evening's presentation features ESU alumnus and serial entrepreneur Dr. Sam Nibala, who will be discussing one, one entrepreneur's story, how to pursue the big idea. Now, he did, he is sorry he was not bringing pretzels. Yeah. Sorry. He has no pretzels, so he has other things, great ideas and a wonderful <laughs> story. His journey began in 19, 
1989 when he launched his first company, Borisher Technologies. The company developed the first rapid HIV test in the United States that was approved for use with blood and saliva. His company also created OraQuick, an over-the-counter version of the HIV test. In 2007, Sam and his partner Bill Hinchy started Cryoconcepts LP, one of the fastest growing companies in the field of cryo-based products for aesthetic and, me and medical use. Sam continues to design new products and technologies. He holds 19 US patents and has developed over 70 new medical devices that have been approved by the FDA. By the FDA. Interestingly, Sam, a chemistry major, met his wife, Linda Lee. I didn't know Linda Lee. Was that really your name, Linda Lee? Whatever. <laughs> Linda Lee Triani, who was a biology major at ESU. They met when they were both enrolled in a judo class, not in a chemistry class or biology class, in a judo class, so protect yourself. <laughs> so Sam and Linda's pride in their ESU education is reflected in their continued support of the university and support in every way you can imagine. Together, they served as co-chairs of the university's capital campaign, Today's Dream, Tomorrow's Reality, that funded the Hafner Science and Technology Center which houses the Nibal Auditorium named in their honor. Absolutely. In 2014, uh, Sam and Linda established an endowed lecture series for nursing enrichment named after Linda's sister, Yvonne Triani Sweeney, a 1978 ESU alumna who dedicated her life to nursing before she was diagnosed with a form of early onset dementia called posterior cortical atrophy. And we have been very fortunate to have Yvonne on our campus many times, and she is truly a warrior in many ways. We are grateful for the tremendous commitment of what I would consider one of our favorite warrior families, Sam and Linda Nibala. They have, they have shown tremendous commitment to this institution over the years, and to be here tonight to talk to you demonstrates that commitment even further. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sam Nivala. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So thanks everybody for coming. Can you hear me in the back? Are we okay? I don't need a mic. It's much more comfortable without it. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank President Welsh. Uh, Mary Frances, the administration. I mean, this is like coming home to us. So as I'm driving up, I'm like, I love coming. And now you start to see the signs that are like warrior country. And I'm like, yeah, we're getting you. We're, <laughs> we're coming in now. Let me ask you guys a couple questions because it helps me frame up what I'm going to cover tonight. Um, how many of you are business majors? Okay. How many of you are science majors? Okay. How many of you are something other than those two? Okay, pretty, pretty good mix. We got all the business majors. I was going to save this to the end, but I will put it out there right in the beginning because sometimes, you know, if I say it five times, you're going to remember it. But in my new company, we're always looking for interns, and I can't seem to find ESU interns. So I'm going to put that out there right now. So but I, this may be a flood or something like that coming back on me, but that's a good thing because we welcome it. All right, so I, I've actually lived several lives, and I'm in the middle of a second one as an entrepreneur entrepreneur. But what I'm going to cover is the first one um, to start with. And so it's Entrepreneur 1.0. I have a 1.0 tonight and a 2.0. And what, I'm going to, what I am going to try and do is share with you the experiences that, that we went through. It was actually not many years after we left ESU. I went to graduate school. I did a PhD, or first a master's in clinical chemistry and a PhD in chemistry beyond that. Um, not too far away at Lehigh University. I went to industry for a couple years. I worked at um, Roche, Hoffman LaRoche in North Jersey, if you know it, and then just had this bug inside that said, I want to do something. I want to invent. I want to make things that people use. And that was always something that's at my heart. And what you're going to see is someone who's developed a lot of products from sunscreens to lip balms. By the way, if you're using Blistax tonight, it may be one of the formulas that I worked with in the early days when I was uh, first formulating and trying to make a living. Beyond that comes other products that the, the old company is more famous for, like HIV testing. So how do you go from one, somebody making sunscreen to somebody now making an HIV test? And 
so let me give you some insights as we go through this. But before we go through this, for you all as entrepreneurs, I think there's some really important questions that we should always ask ourselves. First of all, what defines the big idea? All right, uh, you know, some, I, some things I put up here, money, community, um, helping others. I mean, what, if you had to, I'm an interactive kind of person, so if you had to say, what is a big idea to you? Well, let's just do it by poll again. How many of you would say making a lot of money is a big idea? That's okay. I mean, you could be honest about it. It's okay. There's people that, that feel that way. How about community? Something that helps community. Okay, and community can be defined as employees. It could be the local community. It could be a global community. How about helping others? Oh, all right. That, that gets the most. You know, in my life, I've been able to do all of them. Okay, and, it, and I can share with you that there's times when the ones that maybe you don't know as much had this certain satisfaction because of the science or engineering or maybe just solving a problem. And others, I've had the, the real honor of being able to create things with lots of other people on my team um, and then go out there and really impact the world in a different way. But a good thing to do on the business side I've learned is start with the sort of the end or the bottom line first or the outcomes. And so let's just talk about that. So the uh, 1.0, the company Orsher Technologies, which now exists just a little bit south of here in the Lehigh Valley. Basically, I checked over the weekend and I, I, I haven't looked for a while because I'm on to other things, but the market cap of the company now is $1.2 billion. I'm sitting there going, $1.2 billion dollars. Dude, that's a lot. I mean, that's a big number. But what also came along with that was not just that number for people who are investing on Wall Street, but also that you have 250 employees. You, and remember, every employee that lives in a community spends money, buys houses, sends their children to college, you know, if they can. All of those things go off into the, in various directions and have dramatic effects on community um, locally, but then beyond that, depending on the product, on a global scale. And so let's talk about this. But I, I want you to also understand one thing with this and, and my basic feeling about how I've gone through life as an entrepreneur. Failure is the norm, okay? So if you ever think you guys are going to start off as entrepreneurs and just come out of the gates and, you know, somehow you're going to be, uh, you know, Bill Gates or Phil Knight or whoever it is that's your hero in industry, Sometimes it happens, but I can tell you the average is something much closer to failure until you figure out what the big idea is. So for us, and I had two other partners, which you'll see some pictures of in a short video when we have some fun in a little while. We actually started in 1987. We had nothing. Um, they used to come to our house because we were pretty much newlyweds at that point, and we'd eat spaghetti. Um, the other two guys had good jobs at Procter & Gamble. They had finished their MBAs. They left those jobs to come to Pennsylvania and basically live in a small place. And they have their own story about how they delivered phone books to make ends meet, <laughs> which is, we don't even use phone books anymore, so that's how much I'm dating ourselves <laughs> at this point. But those were some of the, the years, especially in 87, um, when you really had to want to do this. Being poor but being very, very satisfied and having that feeling inside is the difference in making you that entrepreneur. And so what we started out with was energy, a little bit of maybe stupidity because we didn't know how deep we were going to wind up going into this. But we also had opportunities that we created simply by getting out and networking and shaking hands and meeting people. One of those was um, uh, pursuing grants and so we were helped by some of the local economic development agencies, Ben Franklin being one of them here in Pennsylvania, so I'll always give kudos to that. And then later on, we paid that back, and so it went into another company, uh, hopefully to have the same sort of success and be able to pay it forward yet again. We also developed people and skills, and so what we began with, and I'm going to go through the chronology a little bit, is an idea that I mentioned before, which is a sunscreen on a towel. So in 1985, one of the three founders with me, Bill Hinchy, was in business school at Carnegie Mellon out in Pittsburgh. And they had the idea to make a sunscreen on a, onto a towelette. All right, so we'll just do a quick judgment call. What do you guys think of that idea? Kind of, how many would say thumbs up? Good idea? 
Yeah. Okay, and that's kind of what we found. <laughs> the, uh, but, but what we did in, the, in those days really kind of built our character. And so I'll give you a couple of side stories with this. We had no money, right? Like zero. We're all in our 20s. We basically have school debts, all the rest of that. So um, the first thing we did is come up with a formula, which I had some lab equipment that I basically picked out of the garbage. And when we were first selling our house, everybody thought we were drug dealers or something because I had these little stir plates and stuff. All the science majors can relate to this one. Uh, but what I was making was um, sunscreens. I taught myself uh, enough emulsion chemistry um, so that I can make these things. And we started testing and refining and developing packaging, doing all of the things that go into a product. It's the first time that I learned about the FDA regulations and how they govern these things simply by sitting and reading uh, enormous amounts, plus um, I was the only one that still kept my daytime job. So I would go into the lab at like 4 o'clock in the morning, go to my regular job at 8, and then at 6 go back till about 10 at night, maybe 11. Um, we just had our first child and I remember Linda sitting there holding the baby going, we hate daddy. We hate daddy. <laughs> It was a unique time. I mean, and the way we got baby formula in those days, we had a friend who was a pediatrician and she used to get us the samples. But our son has turned out okay, so I guess it was all right. So if you like this sort of story, this is what it's like, you know, depending on how you run it as an entrepreneur. Remember, you can always go out, and all the business majors know this, so I'll do this for the science and the others, you can always go out and raise money. But every time you do that, you give up something, okay? So, the whole balance that you strike in any business is how much can you keep you know, yourselves because you're putting in all the work versus having to sell it off or raise money to help support what you're doing. So for the first couple years, we really invested heavily into this sunscreen on a towelite idea. And the one thing you learned about it is it took the same amount of energy to sell one case for about $35 as it did a whole truckload. But what made the difference is actually a story out of West Virginia University, which is where one of the three founders was from. Now, how many of you shop at Kmart? Anybody? Okay, well wait, I'm just, I'm looking at the, the, the staff and faculty because they're the only ones raising their hand right now. So no students ever go to Kmart? Is there a Kmart around here anymore? Oh, thank you, thank you. The CEO of Kmart says thank you. Right, you go to Walmart now, but in these days, Kmart was the gorilla, all right? And the CEO of Kmart is a WVU graduate. So Bill, who was one of my partners, goes to the WVU alumni gathering, and here's, I think his name was Antonini, who is the last name, who's the CEO, and Bill had been student body president, so he got to go to the, to the uh, event. And on the bus to the WVU game, the CEO sitting by himself, Bill, who had a bottle in his pocket, said, I got nothing to lose, walks over, sits down next to him, and Kmart had tested our product at that point in time. He pulled out the product and said, I just want to thank you for test marketing it. Monday, we got a call, we went chain wide. And so the point of the story is, and you guys are really kind of guilty of it, because you'll see in recent life, I have more 20-somethings. Getting out there, shaking hands, shoe leather still works. There is still a human need for contact and sharing. And this was a great example of how we got started. So the picture over there with the sunglasses kind of comes out of that, but it wasn't enough to retire and move to some island, and so we started all over again. So around 1991, we, uh, after signing this agreement, we began to move forward. We, uh, we actually had enough money now to start uh, doing uh, science closer to my heart, which is in medical diagnostics and medical devices. And we began developing a whole series of products that go along with it. We also um, uh, found a product, and this is where the opportunistic comes in. This was somebody who I knew from Europe, who was living in California, who was looking for a company to take on this product called Histofreezer. So how many of you have ever treated a wart where you go to the drugstore and there's those little cans that you buy and you, you sort of spray it onto a Q-tip and then press it? Anybody ever do that? Okay, well, we were the guys. So after, it's got to be close to 400 million treatments, this was where that idea came from. And all of it was about networking, talking, taking hold of the opportunity, and running with it. So we first started this back in 1993, and it's also one of the first 
medical devices I ever got through the FDA. We also, just to kind of play the history forward a bit, because you could see from around 87 or so, the years um, beginning to flow, we also started to feel our mojo in terms of how we develop product, the regulatory strategies, the marketing strategies, because of the three partners I had, I was the tech guy, uh, the, another one was the marketing person, and the third one was finance. Now, what's the percent of companies that fail when there is a lone entrepreneur? What's the percent? Anybody know? 90%. When you have three people like that with a skill set around the table, it flips. Your success rate almost comes around uh, full circle because you've now got a group of people sharing the skills and sharing the hours. Because for a lone entrepreneur, you're usually good at one of those kind of things, but not all of them. And so you do things mediocre or you fail at things. And this is what oftentimes kills the entrepreneurial um, effort. And so keep that in mind if you're thinking through an idea. You have to look at your team. You have to understand. Now, we weren't that wise at that point. There's many times today people will say, evaluate your potential partners. Make sure you look at them. We never knew each other. We met through friends of friends, and 30-some years later, we're best of friends and have gone through many wars together with products. So again, another element of this is you have to have that right team around you when you go to attack a business. So for us, we, we went through from 87 to 97, creating, uh, and I'll show you some of the products in a moment, but I like to give the, the, over, um, the overview of the history before we went public and after we went public. So I'm, this is the before we went public. So what we're doing here is developing a team, developing employees, figuring out, as I said, our, our each one of the departments and what we do. And ultimately, around the year 2000, we had 100 full-time employees. Our sales were almost 20 million. And because of the types of products that we make, any finance majors, our gross margins were usually around 90%. So we made a lot of money, and we could have just stayed that way. But being men driven by testosterone, we said, no, let's go public, because that's going to be the next thing that we need to do. So let me, before I talk about that specifically, let me just show you some of the products. Because there's a theme that leads to why we went public and what was the platform that we used in doing that. So um, I don't know if any of you have ever been pulled over for a breathalyzer. But one of, the th one of the other ways to do this is to use um, saliva. So here's my cocktail trivia question. If I have a man and a woman, same height, same weight, and they each drink the same amount of alcohol, who gets drunk or more, the man or the woman? And why? Wait, I need one answer. No. We said the woman, right? And why? Because women, on, on average, have a higher percent of fat. Water, alcohol only goes into water, and so it distributes throughout the body evenly, which led to this technology, which is where I could use saliva, because the alcohol is evenly distributed, and I can do this like a thermometer test right on site. So this is still sold today. I think um, the, the maritime industry uses this a lot on ships, because it's portable, non-instrumented, and so it was one of these that we had acquired and and used during those days. The other one that we did is, now you guys are way too young, you're still relatively immortal, um, but as you get older, you, you tend to get insurance, okay, life insurance, and every time you do that, they test you for certain things to see if you're taking anything, substance abuse, whether or not you're a smoker. By the way, how many of you smoke? Admit to it. Oh, that's good. All right, we're making progress. Um, but it's still one of those things that will affect your life, and I was glad to see the low answer response. There's also uh, other things that happen uh, here in the U.S., which is drug testing. Uh, drug testing, we spend a billion and a half dollars on every year, and so we developed a whole line of these, again, because this is my background in immunodiagnostics, and what we married all that to was a number of other devices. This is the one I mentioned before about the what, what's called the Hista freezer, but now over the counter you see the same technology sold by Compound W or Dr. Scholz. Um, all of those were people that, that went off these early um, uh, technologies. Now, this is where it starts to make sense. So 
when we were selling to laboratories and they were doing testing, especially in the insurance industry, they, um, you've never gotten an insurance policy, but the way it kind of works is you have an agent who hands you a bunch of papers, and then there's somebody else who comes to your house or your place of business, and you have to take a physical and give some samples. Well, the last thing you want kind of a paramed doing is sticking you with a needle, or you have to pee in a cup or something like that. So the most simple, elegant way to do it is if I could just swab the mouth, and I could use that as my test medium. And so there was a company in those days out on the west coast in Portland, Oregon, that made a collection device. It was basically a swab on a stick that you would put into a tube and you would mail it back to the laboratory and do a series of tests. Well, it turned out our company um, made all the tests and they made the collector. So in biology, we'd, we'd say that's a symbiotic relationship, right? Each was dependent on the other. And so over a number of years, the business was growing for each party. This other company called Epitope um, was already public and they were focused solely on HIV. Now here, I, as you can tell, I always ask you guys a lot of questions. How many of you think if you have HIV, you will die? Okay, there's a few answers. Well, let me tell you, in the 1980s, it was a death sentence. Okay, it was absolutely a death sentence. Today, there's, there's various therapies, medicines, um, and so you don't feel that way. You feel like it's something you can live with. But in, th in this time, it was absolutely terrifying. I even, one time I was in San Francisco and had somebody come up to me and threaten to bite me because they said, I have HIV, so either give me $10 or I'm going to bite you. This was, this was, it was weird. It was absolutely weird in those days. I know you can't, it's, it's hard for you to relate to this, but I'm, I'm trying to bring you back in history and what it was like in those days. So HIV testing was starting to be, uh, to be done with a simple collection device. The same with drug testing. As it turns out, when you look at what we call oral fluids or all the things that are in your mouth, there's this whole series of markers that exist there. And they, I wouldn't say they exist at like an equal balance between your blood and your saliva, but if you think about what goes into your mouth, it's, it's this big, um, uh, place we have to protect against infection. We certainly want to keep it from bleeding. It's got to be able to heal itself. So there's things like antibodies and all kinds of proteins that do things there. People knew about it in, on the research side, but no one had ever commercialized um, something that could routinely use it in a systematic way and provide good information. And we were the guys who were starting to do this. So if you're not sensing it yet, I hope you're seeing that there's, there's a big idea in here. If you think about how much of this goes on, we only started in insurance testing, but HIV testing alone, drug testing alone, other potential ways that you could do diagnostics, diabetes, cancer, whatever it might be, now you start to see this blossoming into something quite different. So um, the HIV virus back in the early 80s was poorly understood. And so it took a number of years, and it turns out that this other company, Epitope, was one of the guys, a scientist from the CDC, who was part of the group that first discovered the AIDS virus. And he was my coworker um, in, in trying to develop these tests. What was very cool about him is he also told the stories about how they found the virus. Um, it, this is always an aside, and again, you guys might think it's the dark ages, but the CDC literally had a table of men from San Francisco who had rapidly succumbed to HIV. They had all their bloods there. They had no idea why they died. All the blood tubes in those days, when I worked in the hospital, blood tubes were wide open and you know, it was around the lab and just the way it was. Um, and so they're looking at all this, unsure what to do with it. You think about how close they were to that infection, which had no answer at that point. So if they, if they became infected, they were gone in a matter, matter of months. But somehow they said, you know, let's run a test. So you're familiar with Lyme disease, right? The Lyme test, that is the confirmation test, which basically kind of spreads out the proteins and you look at it on what we call a gel. It, they noticed there were some different lines in the people who had succumbed to this mystery illness. And that was how they first started to backtrack into what ultimately became the HIV infection. So, in these years, over these 20 years, there was a lot of fear, there was a lot of focus from the government as well 
into what do we do about this? How do we find it? And so the big ideas started developing. And so between us and this other company, Epitope, we, we started dating. Okay, again, you got to get to know people. And I think it was three or four times before we went to the altar and put the two companies together. They were the kind of company that had a new CEO every 18 months or so who was going to spend, quote, more time with their family. That's that. By the way, if you read that in the paper, that's clue for they got fired. Um, and we were this other side where we were a machine. We had a group of people that were like fighter pilots. We, we worked together in a way where we trusted one another. We built up this capability to solve problems in ways that other people couldn't seem to do. And so we just kept growing and, and getting that confidence, become more and more emboldened to take on bigger projects. And so what we ultimately did in, in 2000 is, um, in the Wall Street world, we did what's called a reverse merger. We took their public company and we reversed ourselves into it to create what became Orsher Technologies. And this is where it now starts to change. So again, a couple things in these early days. The team, the confidence, the trust of one another, the shoe leather. <clears throat> Linda will tell you, or my kids, every time they talk about a story in these days, they'll say, oh, remember when we did do this? And they'll go, oh, Dad, you weren't here. So, but we used to do seven day round the world trips and we stopping in various places, but it was all about relationships and building and opening up the opportunities. So in 2000, we went public and again, we, it, this was a conscious decision that started several years earlier, driven by testosterone uh, mostly. And um, when we did that, the three of us kind of changed things a lot. And I read this article over the weekend, we're not gonna go through it, but there's a statement in here that really hit me, which is um, the day we went public, I think we were worth like over $800 million, okay? And you're sitting there. Now, where we are in Bethlehem looks at where the old Bethlehem steel used to be. And, and uh, for those who may be a little more aged, and perhaps not you guys, Bethlehem steel was a powerhouse company in its day and employed thousands of people and you know people worked their entire lives there and you're looking sort of out the windows and down the river and you see this and you realize that your company is now worth more than they were at that point in time and it was just just like this surreal kind of moment and then we got back to work now the other thing we did and this was us philosophically everybody who worked at our company starting several years earlier, whenever they got a performance review and a raise, we started giving them shares. We didn't have to do that, but what we wanted is the day this happened, we wanted the guy who swept the floor or did the most menial task to be able to either put a great down payment on his house or be able to send his son or daughter to someplace like ESU and have it paid for. And that was our goal. So when you build your companies or you decide to go down this path, Remember the people that are with you. When you do that, everybody elevates, everybody rises, everybody becomes better. And then the great part about that is everything doesn't run through you because everybody's making decisions with the same heart, with the same confidence, knowing that making a decision is really, really important in the sense that if it always has to come back to you, then you're the gatekeeper of everything. And that is a recipe, again, for either overload, burnout, or failure. So we then started to move forward as a group, and we took this idea of <coughs> being leaders in diagnostics based on oral fluids. So the whole idea I was telling you about before, being able to do cancer or infectious diseases or drug testing, all came about. I also want to pause to talk a little bit about my experience with Wall Street. So in the company, I was the chief science officer. And I, you know, again, I have a technical background, and you know, I've hung out with the business guys now for years. I understand what the value proposition is all about. I can read a balance sheet, you know, P&L, and all the rest of it. But I always thought, you know what, we do great science. But the thing I found out about Wall Street in these days is they have no clue what you're talking about. So it was almost like eyes rolling back in the head. The only thing they really understood with us is HIV testing. They understood that this was a big problem and you guys had something special about it. So as we started down this path, we began developing, again, taking that same sort of, you know, be opportunistic, capitalize on ideas, but you also run into another part of the world, which is for those of, how many of you invest in the stock market? 
So what happens when a company doesn't hit their forecast? <laughs> it's, like, it's like the Roman thing, you know, live or die. And, and unfortunately, what happens to us as well is now you're in a 90-day cycle. And while it's great because you have access to capital and you can go after ideas, it also creates this pressure because money's at stake and people are mean. I have to tell you that chat rooms and the other you know, social boards where they post about CEOs or CSOs or whatever in companies, people behind an email will start to do really nasty things and say things they have no basis for. But it, and so it really begins to change you in terms of you know, how you look at all this. It's great in many respects, but it also brings in this whole dynamic that you didn't have before is this tight, private group of people really taking on ideas. But nonetheless, we pursued the task um, that we, we had chosen, which is to develop HIV testing. Now this is, I talk about partnerships, and there's one partnership that came up that was absolutely key in these days, and that was between us and the Centers for Disease Control. You see, the CDC at that point had determined that to stop HIV in the U.S., they were going to have to somehow get to testing people immediately in the cities, because the cities were where it was spreading. People living on the streets would come into clinics, they would get blood drawn, but a blood test took days, and by that point people were back on, on the streets, and whether it was prostitution, sharing needles, whatever the behavior was, HIV was continuing to spread. So what they wanted was something that was immediate, something that could be done before the person left the clinic. And by doing this, they could stop the spread of HIV. So the CDC actually approached us and said, we will help you every way possible, but you guys have to take this on as a task. And so we, we took 40 people, two years, uh, my group, uh, I was saying this earlier, in research at the time was 65 people, half were PhDs, and we, we went after it. <clears throat> and so it took those couple years to develop, but we eventually got the top left, Oraquick, which is a, the product that tests for HIV and now hepatitis C. Uh, we also developed to the right a product called Intercept, which you collect but send back to a laboratory. We also, on the bottom left, have a product called Orisher, same as the company, which is for HIV and infectious disease. And then I worked on a technology called Uplink. Um, uh, and uh, what it did is it was roadside testing, but it involved creating an instrument, software, a complete platform that would do this. So in those days, I also dealt with drug testing. So um, I always tell the story, Lynn <laughs> knows these. I went to many rave parties in Europe during those days. Um, so what, we, what Europe was interested in, and they put in laws, is Europe was fine if you took drugs at home, but the moment you got in your car, they wanted to come down like a hammer. So the police would literally set up um, an encampment around a rave, and a lot of times, you know, it's kind of cool, it's in a castle, and you see the lights, and you're boom, 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 you know, all night. But they're just sitting there waiting for these guys to come out on ecstasy, and we had these tests, and we were working with them. And uh, it was really funny because a couple times I was in Berlin, and this was the old Stasi before you know the wall came down, and they were like, "I hate America." And then they go, "We like Disney," you know. <laughs> and you would have these conversations. Um, but we eventually developed the, all of these platforms around the idea of oral fluids, both on-site, remote. But that the most famous, of course, was the Oroquip. So um, I'll run through them. So. Drugs of abuse, again, very large category. It's, uh, it's one that we pioneered, and what we did with this is, is create this collector that you send back to the laboratory and the tests that go along with it. Now, I left the company in 2004. I understand that just this year, the government is technically approving this for use everywhere. So it, that's sometimes how long the regulations can take in getting something through that seems relatively simple, but it, it changes, the priorities change with administrations. Um, and so the government kind of, you know, one time it's important, next time it goes away for a couple years. And so it literally took well over a decade to move it forward. Now for HIV, the Oroquick test works as follows. You basically have a paddle on a stick, you swipe um, the saliva, you put it into a small vial which contains some liquid, 
and in 20 minutes you get a test line and a control line to say that the test worked properly. And it's a simple yes or no um, to the result. Um, the test itself required an enormous amount of clinical testing here. I think we were in 15 sites and uh, I forget how many thousands of patients we had to run, but our success rate had to be 99.99% um, to be acceptable to the FDA, which meant out of thousands of people, we could only miss a few. And when you're looking at something visual, not an instrument, you get all the variations that come with light and people's eyes, but we did it. And so that was, that was in November of 2002. And um, again, what we got was a statement from the uh, Health, and Human, um, Health and Human Services Secretary at the time that announced this as a major step forward. The, um, in 2002, HIV was roughly 20 years old, and um, I used to go to a lot of the meetings where people would talk about the, the research and what they were doing, but it was the first time that we had really moved forward in point of care. There was no way to do it as a point of care test. And HIV has emotion to it. So for example, I, I give you some side stories. I would go to meetings and it would be all the scientists talking about what they're doing clinically or in the research lab. We would have protesters bust through the door, hemophiliacs for one. Um, anybody who was getting a blood transfusion in the early days of H HIV, you want to guess how many units of blood or how often you would get it if you got a transfusion? Anybody know? One out of every 200 transfusions was an HIV infection. So people were getting it, and the only thing they did is get in a car accident. This is the kind of stuff that, you know, in hemophilia, as you know, you can't clot. So they were constantly getting transfusions, and they were one group that would come in and literally protest during a scientific meeting saying, we weren't doing enough, you people stink, you're killing us. I, I'm sitting there going, we're scientists, why are you yelling at us? But this was the emotion that went along with this kind of um, uh, issue. And so in 2002, we moved forward with initially a blood test. And then <clears throat> what it did is it opened up the door immediately now for the CDC to unfold its plan. But there's, there was one more step in here that had to be taken. There's something called the CLIA waiver. And uh, what it means, what it boils down to without worrying about the acronym, is that uh, if you have it, anybody can use it who is trained. <coughs> The, the first approval we got meant only sort of doctors and highly trained medical professionals could use the test, which limited where you could go with it. And remember, the CDC had the vision of in vans, in clinics, in downtown areas where the infection was rampant, they wanted to be able to use this. So during these days, we had the government calling us saying, submit your CLIA application to us, which was like a second level, and it was a lot of work. But they were like, you have to get it to us. We need it. You need to have it by this date. And like, you never have the government chasing you. You're always chasing the government, right? So we didn't know what was going on during that time. And uh, what we did is, is kind of respond to them, because we saw this as like our breakout moment. And as I said, Wall Street didn't understand all the other products we made, but they understood this one. And so everybody in the news wanted to know about it um, in terms of what we were going to do and how we were going to move. Then what happened was we got a phone call one Friday morning that said, turn on the TV at 10 AM. <laughs> so we turned it on, and the president was giving a speech, and it was about HIV. And uh, the thing he announced that day is this quote that uh, we have, um, you know, how can you treat if you don't test, and how can you help if you don't know? And with that, he announced that our test got this CLIA waiver. So think about Wall Street. Think about everybody going, oh, my gosh, you know what this means. This opens up everything. And so, uh, like, the phones start ringing, Liter literally helicopters came over the buildings. I mean, we're sitting there in our offices like going, what, what is this? And every news outlet that's listed here starts calling and asking questions. You know, we want to talk to you, we want to interview, we want to, we, and so what we did is literally go off and get media training that day about how to answer the questions, what to do, what not to say, you know, who's going to speak, and it, it changed us. I mean, you know, of course, stock prices go up, everybody's clapping, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful moment. But this is, this is the big idea. 
I mean, this is that moment. So you're sitting there and, well, going public was great. Even before that was great. And, you know, so part of it is when you enjoy what you do, every day is, you know, just a blast. And I have to tell you, in this 1.0 life that we led, it was really, really neat to get all the way to this point, even though afterwards you still had nasty people saying things about you in chat rooms or whatever it was, and you had the pressure of the stock market. But this was sort of the, the, the end of my um, tenure also with the science. And this is truly a picture from, you know, if you've been in Times Square and you know, and you know the NASDAQ board, when you go in for HIV day and you're like, you know, the kids are like, Dad, you're on the board. Um, you know, it, it, there's, some, you know, there's some moments in life and everybody has their 15 minutes, they say, but these were some of the best. And, um, you know, I have to, I mean, to the finance guys, they were like, it was like some sort of otherworldly event to them. And so we, you know, we, uh, we moved on at this point. So that was in 2004, I had retired. And the reason I retired is actually because also what happened as a result of uh, becoming a public company is our board of directors changed. And so they were much more driven by the short-term profit. And I'll never forget the one um, board of directors meeting I went to and I was working on a project. And again, I would have lots of projects to report on. And they said, what's your schedule for innovation? <coughs> so I don't know, is there, can you ever schedule innovation? And it was a sure sign that we had, we had moved from something that was like, let's go for it, guys. Let's take the risk. Let's, you know, we're fighter pilots and we'll never be shot down to like, no, I want safety. We have money in the bank. When we see an idea, we'll acquire it. Everything changed. And so in 2004, I retired at the ripe old age of 44. And I can tell you, I suck at golf. And uh, it's not what I do. And so it, it, was, uh, it was a different, you know, time to retire. Um, very cool. Um, I was invited back by um, Lehigh to teach, and so I came back and did research for um, actually up until about two years ago uh, in the chemistry department. But I still also had the hankering for um, product development and commercialization of ideas. Now, Orisher continued, and what they did is they took the HIV test, and eventually in 2012, they were able to get it over the counter. Um, the, you know, it's a different management team. And one other thing that you learn about yourself and perhaps companies is there's entrepreneurs that can exist at all, what I consider all three levels of a company. You know, those of us who love starvation and, you know, donated food and delivering phone books all the way onto a certain point. And then there's the people who like the middle you know, where you're just kind of growing it to that next stage, but it's a nice stable platform. And then there's the people who really run the behemoths and, and they can see that and have a vision and understand what that means. I've learned that I like the early stages. I just love that like we're gonna, you know, everybody's against us and that's why we're gonna win um, kind of stage. And so I moved on beyond this and certainly Orsher uh, kept going and, and you know, some of the things they did is like bringing in Magic Johnson um, they, they had the money to do these things, they've done promotion, and the company has done well. As I said, you know, if you're looking at a $1.2 billion uh, valuation, God bless them. You know, it's, it's a good thing. People are employed. Peop uh, some of the people that started with me are now retiring, and that's, that's sort of an interesting thing to see and realize that they were able to, to live out their careers, raise their families. And um, it's a good thing. I consider that a gift. And it, to me, it was never about the material of the company, but the people. And so when you see that, it's really a joy. OK, so now, is it the end? Do you think it's the end for people like us? Of course not. What's the old saying from Animal House? Did we give up when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? No. Does anybody remember that? <laughs> and the Germans didn't bomb Pearl Harbor. I know. It's just the line from the movie. Anyway. Any questions on this? Any questions? We're going to come back to it. So we have to do this, if I can do this uh, correctly. Mary Frances wanted me to. Hold on. Hold on. You've got it. I got it. Hey, I, I'm, I'm a tech guy. So this, is, so this is now starting off what I'll call 2.0. Uh, expand it. Do two hours. Oops, and then hit escape when it's done.
Okay, so that's my intro into 2.0. And let me just see if I could switch back. All right, and I'm a Mac guy, so I gotta keep thinking left and right. Okay, so Entrepreneur 2.0. So you're in your 40s, you, you take some time now. I, I, I always tell the story, it was sort of like, how many of you have seen the movie Forrest Gump? Okay, so remember when Forrest like runs and runs and then he does this and this. So that's kind of what I did for a number of years while I was teaching. So I did five marathons, countless half marathons. I've surfed 15 foot waves. I've whitewater kayak, class five rivers. And then you kind of get to the end and you go, okay. I mean, the only thing left, which Linda won't allow me, is to jump out of an airplane at 30,000 feet, you know, with an oxygen tank and fly. I can't fly either. But so let's, let's go back to our roots, which is being entrepreneurs. So where we're going to go next, as the video had pointed out, and with different roles, is uh, I'm the CEO in this role. Bill is still the marketing person. And Mike, our third person, is an investor and actually our landlord with where we are. Um, what we're developing is actually the idea that I loved before. OK, so you saw the, what we call the Hista freezer and then those over-the-counter products. But I was always intrigued by that um, market. I didn't tell you as part of the 1.0 story, but that product actually I first sent into the FDA and got it through so that we could sell it as a medical device. And then in early 2000s, um, applied to get it uh, through the FDA as an over-the-counter. So that's why you see it in the drugstores. That product in one year went from zero to 20 million in sales. It was you know, what you find is a number of things in today's world. Uh, people hate this stuff. They don't want to go to the doctors. Um, we're all living longer, which, you know, uh, means we want to look better longer. We want to be healthy. We want to eat better. I mean, all of this ties back into a change in our behaviors. That doesn't mean you always go to your doctor for what it is that ails you. And so what we've been doing is taking a different approach. And I like cryo. It's cool. You know, I'm known as Dr. Freeze. All kind, you know, we could play off this all day. Um, but the, the one key at the bottom here is vanity is universal, right? <coughs> if you think about it, anywhere in the world, I've been in Delhi. I've been in, in Europe. Anywhere in America, you'll always find spas and salons. OK, so let's just, let's just admit to it now, right? I'll ask the females first. How many of you go to spas and salons? Right? How, how many guys? Any guys? Yeah, there's a couple. Th and it's growing. So this is one of those places where you look at the big idea and you say, well, it's in the behavior change. And the question is, can we now create opportunities, you know, work through partnerships, and control your own destiny? Now, control your own destiny is one that I've added. Because when I finished 1.0 as an entrepreneur, life was good. You know, you went public. Everybody loved you, but when you show up again as the new guy, guess what? You get no credibility. It, it's an ugly world out there. And work, uh, working hard, you forget about what all those hours were like. They're back. They're back. And so what we did is we have a small group. We're like 14, 14 people now, 15 people, something like that. And we're growing. But what we've got is kind of the, a few of the people, key thinkers, leaders from 1.0, now joining up with a bunch of what I'll call late millennials. I don't know what the next generation is going to be like. But 20-somethings plus 50 and 60-somethings all blending into this new area. And what we're doing is teaching one another about today's world and also yesterday's principles that we talked about. So I like to call it controlling destiny because the first several years of this company, I left my destiny in the hands of other people. So if you ever have an idea and you put it together and you give it to someone else, sometimes it works out. It can be a beautiful thing. But uh, there's sometimes you get put up on a shelf or management changes and you get de-emphasized. And before you know it, nothing's happening. And your product is perfect. The technology works. But that's not what makes the difference. So controlling your destiny to us, the thing I learned is that we have to get closer to the customer and know how our products are sold. So what we began to do several years ago is what I call hand-to-hand -hand combat. We have individual sales reps who work as independent people. They're out there day-to-day, -day, you know, hawking products and working with customers. We come behind them with what we are 
uh, developing, and so we have this innovation and know-how. We also work with the FDA to make sure that we're always in compliance with what we do. We sell on a worldwide basis, and again, I go back to the team, okay, the capitalization that you have, and then working hard to not sell off the company and doing it. And what that's done for us so far is grow us tremendously in the last few years. So I just want to give you a few slides of the kind of uh, products. So one is actually uh, something that we distribute now that's made in Spain, and it's called Cool Lifting. So a treatment of this in a spa is $150 to $300 a treatment. It's four minutes long, and you look absolutely amazing. I had to learn how to say that. Amazing. Right? Can you do that with me? Um, the very first trade show that I went to, which was all estheticians, I mean, I've never seen such an uninhibited group of people in my life, but they, they, this is what they do. And so uh, in this particular product example, this is a police officer up in Boston. You can see the, the wrinkles on his face. If you look at him on the right, he looks, say it with me, amazing. Thank you. This is awesome that I could get you to do that. So, um, but th this is the sort of group, and people... People love this because, you know, you guys, again, are, are pretty young, immortal at this point. Your skin is perfect. But let me tell you, as, as time goes on and you're kind of going, I really wish for this wedding this weekend or I just want on a regular basis to look better, people, people do this. The other product that we sell is something called CryoClear, which you may have seen in the video. And there, what I did is actually a little combination of history and science. I read 100 years ago that carbon dioxide was used a lot to take things off topically, to freeze and to get rid of things. And as I read this and I saw old Victorian pictures of women with, you know, spots on their face and they were treating them with blocks of dry ice, it kind of hit me that we could redo this mouse mousetrap. And so we developed what's called CryoClear, which is a spray of carbon dioxide ice, which has the benefit of treating very superficially. So unlike when you go to your doctor and he, he or she hits you with liquid nitrogen, which not only hurts like heck, but also oftentimes leaves a white spot because it kills the cells that produce the color, um, this product works differently. And so an example of this is uh, this woman who had these spots for years and couldn't get rid of them. And after a couple weeks and a very superficial treatment with um, carbon dioxide ice, it abraded and froze just deep enough to get rid of it. So you show these pictures to a group of people over 50 years old who have the ability to pay for this. My gosh, guys, think of, the, think of it. <laughs> um, these are sor the sorts of things that, for my mind, uh, I connect the dots on and how I think as an entrepreneur and what I, you know, what I really enjoy doing. I get the adrenaline rush as much out of doing this as I might at Class 5 River. And so let me just give you a couple conclusions here. So I think as an entrepreneur, you need to know your end game before you go into something. If it's going to be your life and you're going to, you know, you want to build a company and a family or a community, whatever it is, that's great. If your goal is to build it and sell it and move on, that's also good. But, but you should know that going in. You should set goals and go against it. I think you should not only swing for home runs because if, it if, if it was a venture capital group in here, they'd be like, we want a home run or nothing. You know, and that's true because their money, they're not looking to have peter out over years and years and years. They want the hit and move on. But for you as people, I, I think the right strategy is you have singles, doubles, and home runs. You practice with singles and doubles, right? Because singles and doubles mean you always have somebody on base advancing, meaning growing the company. That's my metaphor for this. A home run comes up every so often, like HIV testing was for us. And when you get the opportunity, if you've been practicing singles and doubles, you're ready. You're ready to go in the big game. Um, also, you have to have the right team, the right players. How many Eagles fans are in the room? Yeah, right team, right? Right team. They got, they got strength because they're well-rounded. Um, and this is one that's just my personal statement. I, you know, I got paid nothing for a long time. I still get paid nothing to work my butt off, but I love what I do. And so it's not, the, the money came because you did a good job. You did, the money didn't come because you showed up. And that, it's an important one that you have to decide. There, there's a lot of people I meet coming out of university now that are just like, hey, I want my, my big salary and I want my whatever benefits, I want my vacation, and that's fine, 
but you also have to offer something in exchange for that. And the entrepreneur is working on an idea. It's a completely different paradigm. So if you want to come out and be that entrepreneur, awesome. But understand, you should also be happy with yourself and what little you have, and you're living on that satisfaction. The last thing is give back when you can. We really, I mean, the three of us that started Orisher and our families, we, we uh, have always had a heart that says, we thank you so much for what you gave us, whether it's, it's here at ESU. I mean, Linda and I always feel that way. But remember where you came from and that professor who had that profound conversation with you or your roommate or your, the club you were in or that mentor that hopefully you get when you get off into either graduate school or your, your first job. Those are the, the times when you have the opportunity to go back and do something and it's, it's well worth it. Again, it's, it's the satisfaction that comes from knowing you said thank you back to all of those who helped you um, make your way. So with that, I'll end. I, I really appreciate the time. I know I, I, what I didn't tell you about is all the fun failures that came along the way, but we could talk more about that. But let me just pause and I'll ask some questions then. Yes. Did you meet any resistance from established businesses like drug companies when you were trying to get your product out there? Um, so the question was, did we meet resistance from other companies like pharmaceutical companies when we were trying to put our products out there? Um, there, there were small competitors, but I would say there was never a big guy who, who kind of came in. I think they were watching to see what kind of <coughs> success we would have more than anything. So good question. There's over here on the my left. Was it difficult trying to find a balance between the family life and the entrepreneurial life? Yep. So, yes, good question. And I always, whenever I talk to entrepreneurs, I'm always emphasizing work is never worth your family. That is not, you know, we're, we're people of faith. Uh, we always work together. We were always on the same page. Um, she, you know, Linda may have been bouncing, we hate daddy, but that was really, you know, that was the fun part of it. We've always been together and going through things. And even today, we're working um, together in this new company. So family has to come first. It's part of the fabric of you as a person. And if you've made that commitment to your family, stick with it. Because it, it, all things will pass. This passed, and, and now I'm on to the next phase of my life, and that's still here. This moves on. Uh, par uh, well, I mean, there were a number of levels of difficulty. So, for example, and one I didn't talk about, our house was owed to the bank, I think, five times over, okay? Because every time you build a company, you have to, you leverage your assets to borrow money so that you can invest it in your company. And so, although we didn't worry about it, it was always looming out there that if we failed, we were really going to lose it all many times over. So that was one. Um, otherwise, I think it was just the pace because we were in work at 4.30 in the morning and, you know, it just, but that, that's the adrenaline, so. Um, could you describe uh, one of your, your failures where you learned the most and how it helped you um, succeed? Um, yeah, okay. So where I, where I am is I'm always the eternal optimist, and so I've had ideas um, for different kinds of testing, for example, that we would do in different market segments. And uh, I was, well, even, even that one technology called UPT, we spent $18 million on it before I finally concluded this isn't going to work. So, you know, it's, um, you know, at the time I was told go for it, which I did, but I probably should have cut bait far sooner. Regret that? No. <laughs> you never look back. <laughs> That's the beauty about being an entrepreneur. If you look back, you'd, you'd probably jump off the building at, at times. <laughs> you always look forward. <laughs> There's Mary Frances in. If you could go back, would you change anything or relive it again? I, I'd do it again yeah, in a heartbeat. It was some of the best and worst times in, a, you know, in terms of the stress and the rest of it. Uh, I'm not sure. I, the only part I would maybe change is not go public. 
have a question for you. As somebody who's put in a lot of long hours doing some similar things in a different field, what do you do when, to take care of yourself um, when you're doing a lot of the hours? So, um, okay, so th that's a great personal question. So in the, in the time that uh, we were leading up and, and having gone public, during those years, the stress was enormous. I mean, there was so, and there were so many dinners out, and there was so much travel and bad sleep. So I was about 35 pounds heavier then, and um, the, one of the moments of like reality was one Saturday morning. I started to feel my heart palpitating and going, "This isn't worth it." And you know, because I, okay, so I used to, I used to take coffee in the morning in the office. And you know, you get the, like the Starbucks packs to make a pot. I would put two packs in. I would drink two to three pots of that. And then at my lowest in the afternoon, I would drink like a six pack of Coke just to keep the adrenaline going. So I knew in those days that something had to change. So today, I, I, you know, as I said, when I left the job, I started running. I started just living outdoors and doing all those things I couldn't before. The, the question is, is there a reason I re regret going public? Uh, yeah, because the moment we went public, it changed the dynamic. Um, you know, you have to live in 90-day cycles reporting your next, you know, uh, forecast, your next uh, financials. And if you miss it and you happen to drop, I mean, the whole mood of the place changes. It was like, it's like the, uh, the sky is falling. And so your ability to plan out many years and to set a, like a realistic plan to go do things goes away when you become public. How did uh, your parents and the parents of your team handle your journey? Um, well, my parents, uh, my, I think my dad was always a latent entrepreneur. He just, my mom was not comfortable with that. Linda and I were always comfortable with it. She was always behind me 100% in supporting what we were doing. Um, uh, so my mom, my mom actually, when I was leaving ESU as a chemistry major, she actually thought I was a nurse. She, because, no, seriously, my dad went to sixth grade and my mom was a high school graduate. College was not, like, we're the first generation in my family to go to college. So, well, thanks. The, the only thing, my, I have three older sisters, they all graduated, like, with honors and then there was me. So the only thing I did is outlast them by getting a PhD. That was my that was my benefit. So I couldn't get them on grades, but I could at least get more degrees. Um, I know you previously mentioned um, like what a typical day looked like for you when you had a day job and you started entrepreneuring. Um, but like as a typical day job for you now, entrepreneur 2.0, what does it look like? So I'm up at 5:30 every morning. I have some quiet time. Then after that, I'm usually on uh, emails with Europe. Um, so because we sell products in about 20 countries, so I'm, I'm just working, you know, those things. Um, I may go for a run at that point. I find that if I don't do it early, it's not going to happen. So I'm out before daylight usually, and uh, then I'm in the office by 8, 8.30. Um, I, gone are the days of staying till like 8, 9 o'clock at night, except every now and again, and I'm getting into one of those seasons now where we're about to commercialize a new product. And that's when we get cheap Chinese food and we'll be there late into the evening doing testing and documentation. And, but that's the good part because then you birth the new product and you get to go after it. So, uh, What was the hardest part about finding other team members that were as bought in as you were to what you wanted to do? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so in the first years, okay, in 1.0, I had two other partners. Um, so funny story, Bill, who's the marketing guy, we always make fun of him, he won't mind me doing this. Um, myself and the other guy, Mike, who was the finance guy, we were the workaholics, okay? We, you know, weekends, whatever, we, we, just, we just ate it up and we would fight for the first spot in the morning, you know? So we're, we're starting to push 4.30 to 4 o'clock and all that other stuff. Um, the third guy, Bill, he would come in late and at one point early on he goes, well, I'm a narcoleptic. And we're all looking at each other going, I don't know what a narcoleptic is. Do you guys know what a narcoleptic is? Somebody who spontaneously falls asleep. So he played us on this for about six months. We had no idea. We thought he was clinically a narcoleptic. And, but he was bought in. And, and your question of how do you do this with other people, 
this is one of the hardest things for me. Like in my 2.0 life, I've hired a number of young people. And like at 5 o'clock, I'm seeing them walking out the door. And I'm just like, okay, where are you going? I'm going home. <laughs> okay, well, why are you doing that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so, okay. So here's the balance in life. I'll ask you guys the question. If you have someone who's a good employee, they're there at 8.30 to 5, and they work their you know, time when they're there. They're not goofing off. They're doing their job. But they leave at 5. Okay? Is that good? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's good. But, but then you got to understand what you get for that. Okay? That's not showing up between normal hours of 8.30 and 5 and doing your job is the minimum expectation. Of course you should do that. Now, if you're working extra hours, if you're doing other things, if you're taking on other projects, that's extra, right? So you guys, when you get out and get your first job, I want you to think about this conversation. When it's 5 o'clock and you're walking out the door, remember, at the end of the year, your boss may be going, well, you did the minimum, so therefore, you're going to get the minimum. But the person who does that extra, who naturally takes it on, gets involved with the team, does more things, there's a different reward that comes for them. Okay? And that's, that's the way it starts to play out. I don't know if you agree or disagree, but that's the way I've learned it over the years. Yeah, all right. Good. Do you um, <clears throat> think it's required to have a background or a degree in business? Um, and if not, what would you suggest to somebody who has, you know, knows nothing about owning a business? Okay, well, I'm one of those. Um, so you know, clearly, I was the technical dude thinking if I just talked in six syllables, um, I could get by. Um, you don't, th there's instincts that come and there's learnings that you can get. Now, is it good to have the background in business? I, any tech majors, if there's a way for you to take business courses, I would advise that. Have a, have a basic idea and you'll at le least be able to have the conversation. A big part of what I used to do, and I was saying this earlier, is I would interpret from the technology people to the business people go, what did they say? And, and I'd be like, okay, this is what the idea means. Here's what the opportunity is and why they think this is so excited. And they'd be like, okay, how many could we sell? And then, you know, you'd go back over here. And a lot of being able to do that as a technology major, that's an awesome gift because it won't exist over here, but you may be able to bridge between the two. At what point do you feel it makes sense to leave your job to dedicate yourself to your business? So at, the question is, at what point does it make sense to leave your job and dedicate yourself to this effort? Well, ideally, it's when you have some way of supporting yourself. Okay, I mean, that's, that's the perfect one. Or there's a moment in time where you know that if you put the full mo effort against it, within some reasonable period of time, there's going to be at least some money coming in. I mean, if not, then you do what I did, which is you work your job, and you do a good job at that. And there's a whole story behind what I was doing in those days. And then you go off in, in your off hours, you work on your other job. You know? But it's, it's a hard thing. And, you know, again, once you, once you get married, you have a family, you do all those things, it becomes harder, but never impossible. It's just you have to do it together. I have a two-part question. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I saw a hand go up back there. So the first is if uh, a large pharmaceutical company or a CMO wanted to acquire your, com acquire your company at this point, would you consider it? And the second question is, the very first or the second slide, you talked about three particular areas. You talked about finances, you talked about the ability to serve, and you mm -hmm. talked about community. Mm -hmm. at, at 2.0, which is most important to you? Hmm. I, I don't, okay, I, all right, you heard the question. I don't depend on the home run to make it worthwhile. But if it came along because some company said, hey, we really got to have you, um, you figure it out. But remember, even in 2.0, I've already started giving equity and <coughs> shares to everybody. So they will, they will win, you know, either way. Um, but if the company, my real expectation is what we'll do is grow and it will become a viable entity in the Lehigh Valley employing some number of people and they will make good products that we sell around the world. If we do that and eventually we retire and there's other people who come into management, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Money. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. You get to give back. You get to have people raise their families. I mean, and, and they can make money. They could save for college. Whatever it is. That, isn't that life? 
Other questions? Yes, um, what was more difficult, developing a culture or maintaining the culture? Um, I think I think in the beginning it was developing the culture because we were we were twenty something ourselves trying to read books and figure out how to do this. We had our principles, and um, I have to say that you know the other two partners of mine are some of the most honest guys. We had natural instincts. Oftentimes we would walk away from bad things or things that smelled slimy. Um, it was better to say no than to somehow get into it. And uh, so we had certain natural instincts, and then we read a lot about culture and people. And my, my personal uh, bent with all the technology folks was to get them to think critically. So I don't know if you understand what that means exactly, but to be able to take information, interpret it, and then tell me what, we think, what they think we should do next was a key thing. When somebody raised up to that, they were enabled now to begin running forward and they didn't always have to be checking in. I mentioned this before, but I can't tell you the value of teamwork. It's like, how many of you have ever played on a championship team? What was the key element you would say about the championship team you were on? Was it solely the talent? What was it? It was what? Working together. It was that knowing when I pass the ball like this, who's going to be there to pick it up. You know, it's that shot at the buzzer between two guys and unselfishly somebody passes it off and somebody sinks three and it's a national championship. You know, you, you saw that shot. I know you saw that shot. Um, that, you do that in your company as well. So um, do you have an example of a situation where you had to modify a product or kill it before launch based on consumer insight? And do you have a process for that? Um, yeah, it's probably one of the weaker things that we do because we tend to want to think we really know it all. Um, but I would say we've, we haven't killed it before launch. But what we did do is go out, test with consumers, find out that what we thought was a great product really wasn't modify and then go back out. But we didn't kill it. So for example, the sunscreen on the towelette. All right, so for the formulators in the room, the easiest way to dissolve sunscreen chemicals is to put them in alcohol. Works really well, a little bit of water and right, perfectly clear solution. Put that on a towelette. We did a focus group. You know what a focus group is? You go into a room and there's a bunch of people around the table and you show them a product concept. And we, we took out the sunscreen towelettes with alcohol. They went like this over their face. All of a sudden their eyes, <laughs> I'm behind the glass. <laughs> and their eyes turn red, they're like watering, they're crying you know, from the chemicals that they just put on their face. I know, it's, I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> it was just, if you were there, you would have appreciated it. And you went, crap, that's not going to work. <laughs> just, so, you know, there's your, like, right out of the gate, the first example of one of those. And eventually, we formulated it into, a, like, an emulsion, so it was more like a milk, a cream. It smelled good. It went on right. Didn't have alcohol. Didn't irritate you. And, you know, it is what it is. So, good I question. One more question for you. Yep. Uh, I think it's important for business major majors and, and really anybody in business in life here. You touched on instincts. How much do you test your, how much do you trust your gut instinct, and um, how important is it? I think that's real important in business. I just hope you elaborate <coughs> on it a little bit. Okay, so gut gut instinct is uh, is great as long as you're not going to go over the falls for an idea and miss the cues that say you, that you don't have it quite right yet or nobody's really going to buy it. I actually have a group of people with me now. One's highly analytical, and, and we were talking about this at dinner. He's an undergrad engineer with an MBA, and I love those people because engineers tend to think a certain way and layer that with a good MBA from Carnegie Mellon in this case. Wonderful analytical skills all the way over here to another guy who's highly emotional, <laughs> just you know, spout off, yell, and, and so you balance those to kind of get the feeling, and then at the end of the day, you go Last for question. it. Last question. Yep. Sam, what advice do you have for our students as they're pursuing career paths for the future? Okay, well, the, the big advice I would tell you guys for where you're at today is go out, and I don't know what year you're in, but please, please, please go find internships. Um, I've always had tons of interns, and actually in my 1.0 life, um, most of the employees 
came from internships because you get a chance to see people. But it's not only that. For you, there's another really important thing. Whatever the internship is, you get to try something. So think of it as inclusion or exclusion for your future. You may find what you love and you're ready to go pursue it, but you also may go, I hate this, but for six weeks, you could do anything, really, and then move on. Okay, so that, that would be one bit of advice. I really, and, and then when you get out, it looks really good on your resume because you've at least got something to talk about other than you, know, you, you may have worked as a food server or something else. Not that that's bad, but do what you can. If you can do it for no pay or whatever it is that you're capable of, do those internships with companies and organizations. And remember, he's looking for interns. Yes. <laughs> And I want them for me a suit. There, there's one more guy back there. This is the last question. Uh, yep. What are your top three necessities or traits that uh, you need to excel as an entrepreneur? Top three traits. Um, you have to uh, think outside the box. And I know that sounds somewhat cliche, but your first idea is probably not going to work. And so you're going to die unless you figure out some other way to solve it. The second one is you really have to be good at managing your finances because the pressure to spend is always going to be there. And then the third one is uh, probably one thing we touched at, know when to cut bait. <laughs> if it's not working, don't die on the hill for it. I mean, just make the decision and move on. Some other good idea will come your way. Right. Well, it's good they're asking questions. <laughs> Less. Yeah. Um, are there any are there any books that you've read over the years that have helped you, or any other habits that you would say? Well, okay. So more recently, um, I love Shoe Dog, which is you know um, Bill Knight's, uh, Phil Knight's um, story about um, Nike, and and it, I share a lot of the same like journey, and uh, it's it's really a funny book to me. I would say that one. I mean, there's lots of management books and. You know, go go read them. Um, figure out where you really lie, and then you know work those principles. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming. Your questions yes, thank are you. incredible. Thank you so much. And I'm going to call you Sam and Linda because I want our students to know how approachable you are. Sure. I, I hope that if you have questions, if you want, if you have any kind of questions, you just want to say hi. Please come up and talk to them. They're really incredible alumni. And we have gifts for both you and Linda. You do. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.